Good morning, welcome guys to another video. This one's gonna be about Unity Netcode for Game Object, which is currently the topic I am dwelling on. So that's, I spend my free time working on this thing. I like this one. I like MLAPI. I like the, the, the new uh, Unity Technologies multiplayer solution, even though we change six time in a couple of years. Okay, so what are we doing today? I am gonna be showing you a very simple setup that we have to uh, make sure player move around. Um, they join a party, then the party host decide, hey, we're launching the game, and then we go ahead and we just move around. So very simple stuff, just synchronization of the movement, synchronization of a couple of animation, not all of them, there's some bugs, but um, let, let me go ahead and show you instead of talking about it. Okay, so uh, this part here, we're not gonna be talking about, this is my authentication with Discord, um, and it runs a Node.js server, so let's, let's just forget about it. What we care about is this line over here, so host, client, server, and leave as well. This is all um, Unity netcode for game object function. So it's a start host, start client, and start server, respectively. And let's go ahead and say, we're gonna be hosting on this client. As you can see, we are the party owner. We were assigned a random number. So this is player 163. And I'm gonna go ahead and take my other instance, click on client, and then you'll see over here that we are not the party owner, however, 163 is part of this game and I am 255. You're gonna see the same thing over here. So it's being reproduced or synchronized across all the client. And then when the host decides to go ahead and launch the game, it also launched the other player in there. Now we're moving around. You're gonna see, um, gonna see a couple of these happening. What a great way to start video. Okay, so let's try that once more. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and do the exact same thing. So sometimes this happens, let's just, just get that out of the way. It just happens. Let's launch and here we go. So on the left hand side, you're gonna be able to see that some of the animation are bug. My, my player right now, the one I'm focused on, isn't really running. Um, there's some issues with that, but that's totally fine. It's gonna be fixed in the future. I'll talk more about it as we go through the code and on this side as well. So it's the same thing, I can move around and as you can see, it's being replicated properly. Let me jump on this block. And you can see this guy is on the block. Now, um, that's all we're gonna be doing today because I wanna be speaking mostly about just the very simple way we're gonna be able to set this up. It's not much work, actually. It's very, very simple once you get the hang of it. You just need to have all the bases down for Unity Netcode for game object. So, without further ado, let's just jump into it. The first thing we'll need is, of course, the package. If you are just like me and you're upgrading from MLAPI, you're gonna to need to delete the MLAPI package um, and get the netcode for game object package. This one is actually not part of the package manager. So you're gonna be able to, well, you're gonna to need to import that from Git itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and fetch you the link to update that. So over here on docsmultiplayerunity3d.com, you're gonna be able to find the link or you don't have to do that. You can just remember this over here. So come Unity netcode game object. Let's go ahead and copy that. Head back inside of Unity and we're gonna click on the plus. Add package from git URL. This is not a git URL, but it's gonna work. <laughs> so just go ahead, click on add and you're gonna get the, um, the netcode for game object package, which currently is in pre-release. However, it's version one, three, six for me. And while you're here, we're gonna do a step for later as well. You're gonna go under samples and import the client network transform. More on that in just a little bit. Okay, so we got what we need. And um, one thing that I'd like to say, if you are actually moving from ML API, if you're moving from an existing version of that package before, I recommend you, highly recommend you, because I struggled with that for a very long time, to delete your network manager. There is some information being kept in the background that made it so the network manager um, had corrupted values be needed. And I kept receiving issues with game object hashes that wouldn't be found. And that was because some of the data were, were actually hidden behind network manager. So what I did to fix all of these issue is two things. Deleted my network manager, made a new one from scratch, not a big deal. And also just to make sure everything was clean, I reimported all my assets. That being said, we are now ready to move on <laughs> to what, what's going on here. Um, so, to set up this scene, to set up this very simple demo that we have, you're gonna need a network manager, that's for sure. Um, you're also gonna need a couple of prefab. Over here, I have four of them. One of them is called game, 
another one is the party the avatar is the thing moving around with my 3d character controller in it and finally a player that's the most important one um, we will go over them very shortly but just know that this needs to be set up before we go any further okay so let's talk about the flow of this very specific scene over here in this scene the only thing that will matter to you are these three buttons host client and then server they are all connected to a very specific function right here host client and server and they do something extremely simple and that is network manager singleton start host start client and then start server that's all they do they have another function here that that's just something i've made just to make sure the buttons are working properly so we can just ignore that and make sure we press on one of these three buttons if you don't know already a host is basically start server and start client at the same time so um if you want to make if you want to do a two-player game then you don't need three machine you don't need the one that is dedicated as the server and then two client connecting to it you can actually have one of the two players say, I'm going to be the host and a player as well. Um, so that's what hosting is. And then um, another thing that is worth noting in here, when we actually launch the scene, when we press on launch, this launch another scene and it brings all the player with you. Um, that is done through the following line of code right here. And usually when you're changing scene, you would do something like this. You would do scene manager, load scene, through the Unity engine, just like so. Well, this is not what you want to do. When you're doing it on the network, you want to do network manager, singleton, scene manager, and then you load the scene. This way you can bring other player with you. If you don't do that, you're going to be launching um, the scene through just normal means, right? You're not going to bring other people along with you. There's not going to be no messages being sent to them to say, hey, we're all, we're all switching scene right now. So those are all the things that you need to worry about on this page. Very simple stuff. If you don't want to make buttons like I've done, <laughs> you can always just, when you're running uh, your game, you can go over to your network manager and just click on hosting. For example, start host. This is going to do the same exact thing. So as you can see, I have a party and I've joined as this very specific player. Okay. So that is it. Now, what is the next step? You are launching the game. You are actually launching a, a netcode session. You're being a host, you're being a client, you're being a server, you're being anything you want. Um, what is the next step? Well, do note that whenever you're doing that, whenever you're pressing on uh, start host or start client, you are creating a game object. You're creating an object, a network object for everybody who is in your game session. So in that case, this is the network player. And this is being assigned, as you could probably tell, under the network manager over here, a player prefab. That player prefab, when I click on host, is gonna be spawned directly within my scene. And this network player object, it has a network object, so you can see whose it is. So in this case, this is mine. It's a local player. I am the owner and I'm also, this object is also owned by the server because I am the server technically I'm hosting. If I go ahead and I create another one, you're gonna see net player number two. This is spawn, it's not me. I am not the owner and this is not owned by the server because this network object, this net player object is owned by this client right here. Now with that logic in mind, this means that every time somebody else join, there's a new net player object being created. So we're going to use that logic to our advantage and actually do some player stuff, player related stuff in there. So I invite you to actually have an object like this, a network player object. You have no choice actually, so I don't invite you. <laughs> you need to have a network player object. Uh, you don't need to name it the way I did, but a, a player prefab at least. So I'm going to open this one up and show you what goes on. Every time you have a network behavior, um, we we can override on network spawn. This is basically the equivalent of stop, but it happens when you actually spawn the object. All right, now we're gonna head into the on network spawn function. And the first thing we do in here is we check, are we the owner? It's extremely important that we do this. The reason it's really important is because, let me give you um, a scenario here. If we are joining the game 
on our own. For example, I'm hosting and I'm launching the game and I'm by myself in here, I'm just chilling. If I'm just moving around, doing my things, and then a new player joins in, client, this is immediately being thrown in the scene because the other, the host is actually in the scene. Well, what happened is a new net player object is being created at runtime. And even for this very specific host, even though it's not his object, the network spawn function still is still being called. So that means in the middle of my game, this was called on the new net player objects. So to recap, if there's two player, the total amount of time this function can be ran is four time because it runs twice on the host and it runs twice on the client. Why? Because both sides, they see two people. If there's three, then it's three times three, nine times. <laughs> so um, it's very important that you actually have a look at well, if you want to do some operation on this object, it's really important that you check, is that my object? So is that my player I'm trying to, to mess around with? And if that's the case, if it is my player, then um, I'm also checking, well, am I the host? <laughs> am I the, the person in power here? If I am the person in power, I'm going to go ahead and, and spawn one object called the net party object. And there's only going to be one net party and the owner of it is going to be the server. So I do that over here, basically. What I say is I, if I am the server, if this net player object that, had just, um, that has been spawned, if it is mine and I'm also the server, I'm also going to spawn a network party object. And with that in mind, this is how you spawn it. So you have to make sure this is not a game object. When you do a resource.load, you are not loading a game object. You are loading directly the network object. And why do we do this? Because a network object, has a different uh, function there. The spawn, spawn as player object, spawn with ownership. In this case, we're using spawn and we're also passing in this uh, optional parameter that says, hey, don't destroy this with the scene because we're basically about to launch into a game scene. So we don't want to delete this network party object. Plus I use it for a lot of different logic. So it's quite cool. Um, yeah, so that's only if we are the server. And if we are not the server, actually, <laughs> If we are the owner, but we're not the server, so any player is gonna run this for its own very specific network object. We're just assigning a random number for now. So that's the number you saw next to the name, but this could be fetched from a database. This could be fetched from anywhere else. This could be a manual input. The player said, hey, my name is gonna be X. Now, as the owner of this very object, I'm gonna end my um, network spawn function with a join party server RPC, which points right over here to join party server RPCs. Very, <laughs> it's right there. Okay. So uh, what we do over here is we send to the, um, the ID, the client ID of this very specific player. And this is the owner client ID. So as the owner, I'm going to send my own ID and I'm going to send info. Info is basically just a structure that contains a couple of information about the player, player state, permission, alias, player ready, things like that. I have a boolean for is dirty, which I said I was using, but I don't think I'm actually using right now. Um, this was part of the test, actually. You know what? I'm going to remove that and just clean it up a little bit. Um, and I also override a couple of function. Actually, I only override two string, but I implement high network serializable and also I equitable. Just down here, very simple way. Um, we don't need custom logic in this case because reading this very specific object is the same as writing it. So I do it in a very you know, I do it in this order. It doesn't really matter in which order I do because the, the fields are the same on both ends. So when you're reading and also when you're writing, there's more complex example online if you want to have a look at that uh, in case you need to do, for example, a list of values. And um, one last thing is we also override equal. I think I should be overriding this. Well, it doesn't give me any error for now, but <laughs> I don't know why this works. Um, and I only check against player alias right now, which is a very bad thing. I'm going to change that to a GUID once I have one. Um, doesn't matter for now. So this is a very simple structure and it's a structure that is serializable. That's the important part here. Why is that important? Because this value is going to be sent across through um, a stream. So we need to be able to put that value inside of a network stream. To do that, we need to make sure it's serializable. To make sure it's realizable, we make sure we inherit from iNetwork serializable. 
which in turn will force you to implement a function like this. Very simple stuff. Yeah, I think we're good here. That's my, that's a very small definition of what is a player within a party. Now, with that in mind, once we know this information, it's now possible to send in a network party player information through a RPC, which was not the case if this was not serializable. So we would have, this value would be, would be uh, corrupted or would use default, would use default values for the fields inside of it. But now since it's serializable, it's gonna actually send the right data. So here we change it and then we send it over. It goes through just fine. If you're not familiar with server RPC, basically what this does is uh, well, first you need you need to have a couple of things for this to work. So, the name of the function must end with server RPC written like this. If it's not written that way, it's going to tell you in the console. So don't worry about that. You don't need to remember this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it needs to be written this way. And also, you need to add the server RPC tag just on top of it. The way this works is as for example as the second client who joins. So as this guy which is not the host, as he joins, he needs to be able to join the party. But joining the party is, you know, the, the network party object is not his. So that's not his object and making a modification to um, put, 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 put the list of every player who's in there right now is not gonna work because he is not the owner of that object and therefore he's not allowed to make any modification that's gonna be reproduced across the network. So a client that does not have any power over the network party object should not be able to change what is inside of the list over here. So the network list of player, it should not be able to do that. The only person who should be able to change stuff in that list is the owner of the party uh, network party, which is the owner of that object, which is the host basically. Um, so what we do instead to make sure that we can actually join a party is we call a server RPC. So this is actually going to queue up this function with these very specific value that we, we have at the time of calling this function, but it's not going to be ran on my machine as a client. It's going to be queued up to be ran by the server. So on, uh, you're going to give it a very small amount of delay just for the, the, the message to be sent over this way with the information. And then this is going to be ran on the server. So the server is then going to find the network party object and call join, which is a simply, it's just a function that's gonna say, hey, fire this event. This event is called player join, invoke it with the following parameter. What exactly happens when we join? So we were aware over here that there is a new object called a network party. That party is being spawned. It creates an object with this very specific script on it. And if we have a look, on that network party in the start, if I am the owner, so if I'm the server, I register myself to events. What are those events? Player join, player leave, and also scene changes. So here they are, all of them. Player join, when somebody fires the player join, which we saw over here, when somebody does that, it just calls on player join, players.add, player is a simple list of network player information, it adds this player to the list. Same thing for leaving. So, you know, no, no big deal over here. It's the same exact thing. All it does is listen for player that joins. And when it receives that event, it simply adds them to the list. So there is nothing complicated over here. There's nothing fancy about it. We could shortcut this and actually make sure the join um, does that over here, for example dot add and then we could do player just like so but I'd rather not do that um, if you want to do that if you want to shortcut it without having any events feel free to do so something like that could work but I decided to take additional steps and add a event in between them in case in the future I want to hook something else to the network party object um, and listen if a player joins for some for some reason, for example, if, I, if I'm thinking quickly, um, maybe the UI could be subscribed to network party and when it receives the event that somebody joined, it could do a modification to the UI, just add or create a new prefab that goes inside of you, something like that. <laughs> Basically, 
there's one more step in case I want to hook myself in between it. And one more thing, the reason we see it down here is because I have a simple script on top of my network party object, which is right here, called the net party debug. It just, just is there to display me what is inside of the list. So it's really as simple as this. It's using the old uh, GUI system simply because I didn't want to bother too much with it. I'm going to delete that eventually, so um, not a big deal. So I find my object, network body. I then, if uh, my Boolean to display this thing is active, I begin an area, write the status just by doing a iteration on all the party members. So party.player.count. So this is my array we saw earlier, this one. And I just write it down as a GUI layout label. So that's what you see down there when this is um, activated. It's just a simple way to see who's in the party. Okay. So that pretty much wraps it up for the party part. Um, the second part we're going to be talking about is the network transform and also the network animator. So this is what you see when we're moving around. It's synchronization of the movement. It's synchronization of the animation to some extent, not, not fully, but it's starting to work a little bit. And uh, we're going to have a simple look at it right now. Now, let me show you where the entry point for that is. The entry point is actually under the network party as well. So in my network party, I make sure to register events. And in there, there is a scene change event. This is right here. This is actually being called every time a player on the network, anybody, finishes loading a scene. So this means any client that joins and that is uh, that has completed loading a scene, so in this case, it could be the hub scene, which is my game scene. It could be any other scene. This is being fired with the following signature. So client ID, the name of the scene, and also what type of mode was it? Is it added, uh, like, is it um, you're loading the scene or is it additive loading of another scene on top of the one you currently have? So my entry point for moving, moving stuff around is actually right here. If a player on the network um, signs in and load the hub scene, we are then going to spawn an avatar for him. So you're going to see down here, again, since I'm spawning an object, I'm using the server in this case. So load player avatar server RPC, which you'll find down there. All we do is declare ourselves a new object, network object, instantiate it from the resource folder as a network object. It's the net player avatar, and we spawn with ownership this time. So um, very important that we spawn with ownership. We are going to be spawning a network object and we're going to be giving its ownership to the new person who just signed in. Why do we do that? Well, we do it for a couple of reasons. First, um, simple stuff like if I want to be able to be the person responsible for moving this object, I need to own this object, else I don't really have the, uh, the authority to do it. But also because in this case, if I decide to be the host, which is this guy, and now we have the new player, which you can see in my background. Let me just park it over here. Yeah. If I decide to quit mid game, like so, I want my objects to be cleaned up, right? And this is going to work automatically, as you can tell, without any issue if the owner leaves. Like basically what, what happens is when the owner leaves the game session, everything that he owns gets destroyed. So in this case, he owned his player avatar. He got destroyed. He also had the net player, which you can't, you can't find his net player anymore because he owned that. Therefore, he is now out of the game. Okay. All right, so with that in mind, let's have a look at what is inside the network player avatar. This is my prefab right here. It's a complex prefab, has a couple of things. And the reason why it is so complex is um, because it contains my state machine for moving stuff around. This one is open source. You can find it on my GitLab. It's just a mean, it's just a third party controller basically. Um, and it's right here, has the character controller, has the character system, which is all part of my moving stuff. Um, nothing you need to worry about here other than the client network transform, network object, and the network animator. So just imagine that when you spawn this object, you can move it around. That's the only thing we care about. Um, 
I'm just going to quickly show you how I did it very, very quickly. This is a network behavior object. And if I am, um, because I want to be able to use things such as abilities, buff, equipment, um, and, and a couple of different things. And I want to be able to, to use that across all the players. Um, and I want it to be replicated properly as well. So I would like the host to look into the client object and be like, hey, what is your speed? Or hey, what is your um, ability power? Things like that needs to be possible in my case. So what I do is I just make sure to instantiate my character system, which contains all these things, attribute buff equipment I talked about. Again, I'm on a tangent, so you don't need to listen to this, but <laughs> um, I instantiate that. I, I made sure it's actually hooked up. And if I am not the owner, I'm actually leaving this code. So this is not being read. But if I am the owner of this object, then I need to be able to do more than just um, just have that information stuck inside of the object. I need to do more. So I need to, first, I grab all the piece of UI that I need. So the display about my attribute, display about the buff, equipment, ability. I grab all of that and I first assign them and then I initiate them, which is a fancy way to just say, hey, look, for example, here, my attribute display, right? My attribute display, I want it to be displaying two attribute, jump force, the speed, and for example, let's add another one for the sake of looking at it, uh, my critical strike, for example. So I launched that, and now it's going to be part of my UI. Okay, so this is all UI stuff, followed by the most important part of here, my motor container. What is that exactly? This is the, the logic behind moving the player. And the reason I wanted to show you that is because I instantiate this, the player motor, but I only instantiate it once, if you think about it. Because yes, this object, this player loader is on all the thing that you see. So all the player that are being a part of my game, they, they all have a player loader and they all own their own character system but they don't go beyond that point. So, so they don't go beyond that point unless they are the owner. So only one motor is being spawned, which means uh, whatever third party character controller system or first party, whatever movement system you're using in your game, um, this is the place where I decided to put mine because this is being only run once. And then I can say, hey, you know what? Um, change the layout of the object a little bit. Maybe this becomes the, the, the parent of another object. And I also make sure to assign my target. So what object am I going to be moving? When I'm going to be moving this, um, this is all part of my code. And the rest is just camera stuff, um, orientation stuff. The key point, this is being run only once which means if I have two player, I don't have two motor, I don't have two camera, I only have one, and it's being attached to this very specific object. Okay, long tangent, I hope this made sense to you. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna leave on the very last thing, which is synchronization of the animation and also synchronization of um, the transform. So it's extremely simple. All you have to do is just go on the object that you are moving or go on the object which has your animator and add this very specific component. So for the animator, it's a network animator. Still need a little bit of work, but you're gonna be able to see that the network animator is actually on version 0.1.0. So it's not completely done. They do mention here that not all the triggers are being synchronized and here's a workaround for the moment. I decided not to care about the workaround for this moment. I decided to have broken animation and see if this could get a this could get better in the future. Um, yeah. So all you need to do is synchronize that and you're going to, you're going to see the result that I've had earlier for animation. So it's a bit clunky, but you know, it, it works for now. Now, um, same thing for the network transform. All you have to do is on the transform you're moving around, you need a network transform. And as you can see on this object, I'm not using network transform. I'm actually using call something called the client network transform. So that pretty much wraps up the video. One thing I'm going to say before I end, um, and it's something that <laughs> I hit my head against uh, for a couple of hours the other day. If you have an RPC, just like this one, for example, you have to call it from the same object, the same network behavior. If you're going somewhere else, for example, if I'm on, so this is under the net player, it's a network behavior. Uh, and there's a function here called join party server RPC. For example, so if I go on any other object, I do something like uh, 
find objective type net player and I do join party server RPC like this, send in the right information. It doesn't really matter. If I do that over here, it's not going to do what you think it does. So yes, it's a join party server RPC, but it's actually not going to be run on the server RPC. You have to be really careful when you do things like that, because if you're not calling the RPC from the same object, the same network behavior, you're going to end up with weird results right now. And there is no, there is no logs. There is no warning. There's no anything that's going to tell you that you're doing something wrong. So if I call this from a client right now, this is going to be run on the client. It's not going to be run on the server. It's going to be run on the client. Sometimes I think I had it run on the server as well. Not the result you want because then you get desynchronized data. So it's very important that when you do something like that, you do it on the same object. So if I want to call join party server RPC, I do it from the net player object, which I do right here. I hope this was helpful to you. I, I've been on attention. I haven't made any videos in a while, so maybe this one was a bit clunky. But uh, I feel like I threw a lot of explanation now there and I'm going to keep on making videos because I'm having quite a lot of fun nowadays and I'm having a little bit more time off uh, recently. So, hey, hope you enjoy and I'll see you very, very soon again with some other netcode stuff. All right, guys, catch you around. Cheers.